Okay, so well, good morning, guys. I hope you guys are cozy sitting at home or in the classroom out of the snow. Um, today, what we're going to do is continue or complete the uh, herbs that we started last week. And depending on where that leaves us, we're going to start talking about uh, selecting herbs and formulating herbs for specific cases. I have not uploaded those slides yet because uh, I haven't decided precisely what we're doing yet. It depends on how much I get done today. Because um, I might make some changes to the slides and update it because I have a few new things I want to add to it. And uh, so I'll maybe upload something during the break. We'll make a decision then. Uh, and if you're watching the recording, it's already been uploaded. So, so before we start, do you guys have any questions? I assume you guys got your exam marks, uh, and I'm pretty confident the majority of the class will be happy with their mark. I'm sure there's a few people who aren't, but I think in all, I think everyone will agree it was a fair exam. So here's a question here. Um, and Amanda will probably mention this again later on when we talk about the cases. Amanda's asking about uh, herbs that target gallstones in the ones that we've mentioned so far. A lot of them have cost with possibility of facilitating a gallbladder attack. In this case, is it all about small dose? Um, I'm going to save that for when we're talking about uh, the uh, conditions. We'll revisit that. But just basically, when you if you have gallstones, you could eating anything could potentially aggravate uh, a gallbladder. So if you give bitters, it'll make the gallbladder work better. Um, and depending on how the stones are, uh, it could aggravate things. Is it a matter of dose? Could be. I mean, within the therapeutic range, that could still have the potential to get the gallbladder working better, which is good. Uh, but if you've got a stone in there, it could just, depending on the size and how many and everything else, it could just irritate it. And in some cases, maybe surgery is a better option. But in most cases, I haven't seen any major issues giving herbs for that. Certainly, if you eat, uh, if you had a pulled pork sandwich with french fries, that would be much worse for your gallbladder than having a little bit of a digestive bitter. Okay. <clears throat> so vulnerates, let's, uh, let's start with chamomile. So chamomile is one of my favorite herbs um, to use in practice. I think it's a great herb for people to drink on a regular basis. Um, the main active ingredients in chamomile are going to be basically different types of flavones, primarily apigenin, uh, and probably some other flavonoids as well. I'm sure there's quercetin and some other things in there. And apigenin is an interesting uh, compound. When you look at the structure of it, we know it's going to be an antioxidant because it's a phenolic compound. But it also appears to have a significant effect on relaxing smooth muscles. And that may be one of the compounds in chamomile that's responsible for it having uh, an antispasmodic effect. And so when you look at the traditional indications for chamomile, it's used primarily for digestive upset, stomach ache, um, gastritis, any kind of irritation in, in, uh, to the stomach, and also for colic, digestive colic, uh, and, uh, and sometimes for infantile diarrhea as well. So it has this picture where it's a very gentle herb for the digestive tract when things are inflamed and cramping, um, and, uh, and also if there's a little bit of diarrhea associated with it. Now, this is probably one of the mildest herbs you could uh, use, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think that chamomile is a herb that everyone would probably get some benefit from drinking on a regular basis. When you look at the research studies on chamomile, we know that um, there's, because it's loaded with antioxidants and has a bunch of polyphenol compounds, it may help reduce the risk for heart disease, uh, 
the study was done in um, women in Mexico, and they found that with those who were drinking on a regular basis had a lower risk for heart disease. Didn't see the benefit in men for whatever reason was. I don't know what that is. I suspect it probably would benefit, but in that study it didn't. Um, and so for health promotion, I think drinking on a regular day basis is good for uh, because of all the antioxidants. Also, apigenin may have a, a very slight calming effect. And so chamomile tea is a very gentle um, sedative. Um, and can help with anxiety. There was a double-blind clinical trial showing that chamomile was superior over placebo for helping people with generalize anxiety. When I compare this to, uh, I mean, it works on the benzodiazepine receptors or the, the GABA system in the body, um, and apigenin, which is the antispasmodic compound. I think that's one of the things in there that may be involved with having its anxiolytic and calming effects. Um, now, if someone had severe anxiety, it may not be as effective as taking, um, you know, Valium, like a benzodiazepine drug. But the nice thing is, is that it can help relax people and doesn't cause the side effects that can occur with taking benzos. And so it's not going to be habit forming like these drugs that are strong uh, sedatives. Uh, it's not going to be uh, causing amnesia. It's not going to be causing major uh, grogginess the next day if you take it as a sleep aid. So even though it's not as powerful as some of the sedative drugs are, that's not a bad thing. You know, you don't necessarily need a bulldozer you know, to help you sleep sometimes. You just need something to kind of help to shift things, to calm you down a little bit, to relax you. And... Considering that with anxiety and sleep aids, there's a big placebo response uh, for when people take these uh, uh, herbs, drugs, placebos, whatever it is that they take before bed. Um, I'm okay using something gentle for most people uh, rather than getting out the big guns. And the big guns uh, are really, can be quite dangerous. When you look at uh, Michael Jackson, apparently when he died, he overdosed on a bunch of strong sedatives because he had a bad anxiety disorder uh, and he was taking some off-label uh, drugs that were used off-label that are normally used in surgery and combining a whole bunch of things and, and, it, and you know, that's an extreme case where it resulted in death. Um, but in general, I just don't think that most people taking sleeping drugs need to be on it. And chamomile would be an example. There are lots of other herbs I would use as well. but. What I like about chamomile also is the fact that um, you can buy it pretty much anywhere and you can, uh, and it's very cost effective and you can take it as a tea and it's effective uh, in that form, or you can take it as a capsule or you can make included tinctures. Okay. Um, one of the other constituents in, um, oh, and just as an aside before I forget, with chamomile, there's also some studies that show that it may help improve blood sugar levels in diabetics. And now I want to just emphasize that when you are treating heart disease and diabetes, trying to prevent strokes, um, all of those chronic diseases, diet is the number one thing. And if someone's eating a lot of meat and lots of sugar and processed foods and everything else, a little bit of chamomile tea is not going to do anything for them. But um, if you include this as part of many changes, you can have a profound effect. And so some people, if they like the taste of chamomile, because not everybody does because it's a bit bitter, um, then including chamomile in the diet is great for that. Another thing that I really like about chamomile is women can drink it as uh, for menstrual cramps. And so it can be acutely taken uh, if a woman's out somewhere and she's getting some bad cramping pains from her from her menstrual cycle. Um, chamomile would help with that because uh, it's got a few different compounds that would have that anti-inflammatory, anti-spasmodic effect. Someone said that I skipped artichoke, so I'll go back to that next. As an aside. Um, so what else have we got there? So we got heart disease may help as an antioxidant, chamomile may help improve anxiety, help with sleep, uh, with uh, digestive upset, uh, 
lots of different things. Now it also contains matricin, and matricin is an essential oil uh, component of it when it's, well, it becomes modified to become essential oil. Uh, the matricin itself isn't necessarily um, uh, an essential oil itself, but it's a sesquiterpene lactone, which is going to be somewhat water soluble, and uh, under certain conditions it can become uh, uh, form certain volatile oils in it. And there are other essential oils in chamomile as well that I haven't listed because there's hundreds of things in, in herbs. I'm just trying to focus on a couple of things. So the mattress is presumably one of the things that gives it that bitter taste. Um, and I'm assuming like a lot of the cisplatyrpene lactones that it's going to have some anti-inflammatory properties associated with it. I think that um, there are multiple phytochemicals working synergistically to have that effect. Now, when I go through the list of actions, there's a whole bunch of them. The primary thing that I usually think of for chamomile is inflammation and cramping. And chamomile, when I go through the list of actions for it, its main thing that I think of it for is as a vulnerary, a thing that helps speed up wound healing. And so examples of vulnerarys would also be things like chamomile, comfrey, um, uh, plantain. And, but chamomile in the German tradition has that affinity for the stomach, for gastritis, for uh, stomach ulcers. And what's neat about it, so vulnerary is one action, and then the other action that you can kind of deduce by the fact that it's vulnerary is that it has anti-ulcer properties. And so vulnerary is included in topical skin preparations for eczema, uh, for burn creams, uh, you might find wound healing in general, and also internally. And so it seems to modulate the inflammatory response to have that beneficial effect on, on uh, decreasing inflammation and allowing for things to heal. Now, because of the presence of the essential oils, it has a carminative action. And because of the presence of the apigenin, it has that antispasmodic action that's a little bit different. So the apigenin is not part of the essential oil component. Um, and as I mentioned before, essential oils have some antispasmodic effects, but so do other compounds as well. And so carminatives are only associated with the essential oils, while the antispasmodic could extend to other compounds, including the apigenin. Now, I think the anti-inflammatory components are related to things like the sesquiterpene lactones, like matricin, because a lot of the sesquiterpene lactones in general uh, act as anti-inflammatories. Uh, and I think the apigenin also, because a lot of flavonoids have some gentle um, um, anti-inflammatory effects as well. That's related to, um, um, they have some abilities to inhibit some enzymes. I don't, I'm assuming apigenin has that as well. Um, I think another reason going back up to the anti-ulcer effects, some studies that I looked at, it appears that chamomile may inhibit the growth of H. pylori, and H. pylori is one of the main causes of stomach, uh, stomach ulcers in people. And so it may directly affect the growth of uh, H. pylori, and that would make sense why it's used often historically for stomach ulcers. I don't think chamomile alone is going to eradicate a, a uh, H. pylori infection, but I think it can help. Um, and especially maybe preventing recurrence. And then the other thing is that um, the reason why it may help with anti-ulcer is that it might just lower stomach acid a bit, not as strongly as like a proton pump inhibiting drug that suppresses stomach acid by like 99%. In my opinion, those drugs are overkill. Most people who, uh, unless you have a really severe ulcer, um, you probably don't need those drugs. And if you do use them, you only use them for short periods of time. Chamomile might just sort of help to drop the stomach acid a little bit, um, just to reduce the um, the um, caustic environment in, in the gut, okay? Um, so from an anti-diarrheal standpoint, like I mentioned, it's often used for children's diarrhea. Uh, you know, there's some classic indication for it, for like when stools are green, infantile colic, and it may suppress uh, peristalsis a bit and normalize it a bit. 
and that's maybe why it has that anti-diarrheal effect and maybe it has some inhibitory effects on some of the pumps in the gut but it's very mild so um if a child or an elderly patient is really sensitive to drugs i might consider using chamomile on that person uh, also because of the flavonoids again and some of the other things i think the bitters and flavonoids both exert some anti-diabetic effects and i know that bitters in general have an effect positive effect on the pancreas and can have a positive effect on blood sugar metabolism i've seen that with gentian uh, when we mentioned gentian earlier, it's like a classic digestive bitter. It doesn't contain sesquiterpene lactones, but contains monoterpene lactones. And we know that gentian, there's been a study showing that it may help with weight loss uh, by reducing caloric intake uh, and modulating taste buds and a whole bunch of other hormones in the body. And it may be that chamomile has that benefit as well. So for, as a weight loss drink uh, and to help with diabetes, um, if they like it, why not give it to them? Because it's cheap. Uh, the final thing is, or not the final thing, but one of the other things is it does have a slight cholesterol lowering effect. So again, it may not be huge. And I find with patients, if their cholesterol is you know, 20% higher than I want it to be, there, there are drugs will lower it by a good 20%. There are natural products that will do that as well. Appreciate, um, uh, statin drugs originated from funguses like oyster mushroom. So yeah, you could give uh, things, fungal extracts like red yeast extract or oyster mushrooms or other things like that to lower cholesterol, which I don't generally use. Or you could change the diet. And when I look at chamomile and I compare it to other herbs that we've discussed, this is a herb that I consider to be more on the food end of the spectrum. So appreciate in herbal, in, in, in medicine, in our medicine, naturopathic medicine, you know, you've got let food be thy medicine. You know, that's kind of what I think is a great, uh, a great uh, saying. And I say that you know, herbs fall under that spectrum. So on one end of the spectrum, you would have something like uh, chamomile tea, and that's kind of a food. And then you have chamomile tincture, which is still going to be food-like, but you're doing a more concentrated extract and you're going to be losing certain things and it's going to be more concentrated in some way. So it's, it's kind of still in that kind of gray area. And then if you were to isolate a single active compound and give apigenin uh, in isolation by itself at a really high dose, then it's becoming more like a drug. It still technically isn't a drug, it's a natural product. But in my opinion, you can't compare the benefits of taking apigenin in a high dose compared to taking chamomile as a whole herb, just like with turmeric and curcumin. Turmeric is a food. Curcumin is a natural drug, in my opinion. Okay. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, it's a good sedative. So sometimes um, I'll recommend it to people to drink before bed, but you can also drink it during the day. You're not gonna. You're not gonna. If you drank a bunch of chamomile and got in your car and went driving, you're not gonna crash the car. You know? And that can't be said necessarily for some of these uh, strong sedative drugs. It gently kind of takes the edge off. It kind of takes, uh, makes you a little bit less edgy and jittery. So the benefit of that is you may be more relaxed, so your mind's not racing as much, so it's easier for you to go and fall asleep naturally. Uh, but it won't, uh, you know, if there are certain drugs that even if you don't want to fall asleep, if you take enough of it, you will be unconscious. Uh, and that's, uh, I guess, good if you're going in for surgery, but bad if you're um, not wanting to have that effect. So let me just have a, have a look at some of these questions. Uh, is it correct that only chamomile leaves have the active ingredients? Uh, uh, is it correct that only chamomile leaves have the active ingredient, ingredients? Heard this at the OND convention this weekend. Uh, hi, Caitlin, I probably saw you there, right? Um, Leaves or the petals? You know, my, I I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. Uh, I would challenge that. And you know what's funny about being a naturopath is that lots of people have opinions and there is some science to back up some of those opinions. And sometimes the science is 
you know, I sometimes think something that I believe is right, and then I, I I've had strong opinions before that I've changed over time, um, and I've also had strong opinions that I was right on. So I would say I know that looking at that chamomile, there are all sorts of yellow compounds in that nice center part of the flower there that probably have some therapeutic effects. And, you know, what is the therapeutic effect? I would say that you're probably going to have some of the active ingredients throughout all of the chamomile plant because, like, it may be higher amounts in the petals versus the leaves. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised. So I think what you're saying is is the the petals. Where did you go? Petals, yeah, not leaves. Probably. I think the flower itself is what the active is what has most of the active ingredients, but the leaves will have some as well. There's there's something in the leaves that will have some beneficial effect, but. I wouldn't use the leaves exclusively. Normally when you buy chamomile tea, it's the whole flower that you're getting at, okay? So it's the head of the flower that you're usually getting at. It doesn't usually contain leaves. So if I bought a bag of chamomile tea and all I had in it was the roots, uh, that wouldn't be what I would be striving for, okay? Uh, is fever fruit from the same family as chamomile? Absolutely, they're both in the Asteraceae family. They look a lot, they almost look identical to, you know, if you had no experience in identifying plants, I think it would be easy to mix up chamomile and fever fume. Uh, and they both contain sesquiterpene lactones. Uh, they both have some essential oils in it. Um, they both have anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, and fever fume is usually used more for migraines. It does have some antimicrobial effects. Caramel has some antimicrobial effects. So there's some overlapping things, but the sesquiterpene lactones and fever few um, seem to have an exert an influence on mast cells in the body that are related to histamine release. And so it helps to lower fevers, hence the name fever few, um, and also um, helps with migraines. So it has a different group of indications. So chamomile doesn't really, uh, that's not its primary indication. You know, does it work for migraines? I have no idea. It might, but that's not what I think about. Uh, so, a question from Dawson. So, although chamomile is bitter and provides some digestive aid, is it directly associated with bitter tonics? Um, I would say that it's it's sort of a secondary, like a lot of herbs have primary actions and secondary actions associated with them. And I would say that I didn't list bitter as the main thing, even though it does have bitter principles in it. Um, because I don't recommend like gentian is probably a thousand times more bitter than chamomile is. Uh, if you took two drops of a chamomile tincture, you wouldn't scowl, you know, you wouldn't go, Ugh, and you would do that with, with gentian. And frankly, um, that's, well, some people do, some people hate chamomile, like it's a strong, they just dislike it because of the bitterness. And I'm like, well, suck it up and drink it. Like, I think we need more bitters in our diet. I actually don't mind making my patients suffer from drinking bitters. That's the only way I make them suffer. But from going to the gym and drinking some bitters, yeah, you know, suck it up. You, know? uh, you, you need those things. Um, so it is a bitter. It will probably promote digestion to some degree, but it's not the main action, okay? Uh, and Mike is asking, different parts of the plant contain relatively high amounts of certain phytonutrients than others. Is that a question mark or a statement, Mike? I, I, I agree with you. Yes, I agree with you. So again, if you look at, for example, golden seal, uh, and I haven't listed these, and, you, and I don't need you to memorize every single thing because you're not going to be required to make herbal extracts from scratch in your practice. And if you want to do that, awesome, do it. You know, I, I, I do it for some things. Um, but you got to make sure that if you're making a tincture of golden seal, uh, don't buy golden seal flour, which is relatively void of the hydrastine and berberine. Make sure you get the root, which is a lot more expensive. So I have seen products on the market that are selling the wrong product. But yeah, you got to make sure that just like if you want to eat an apple, uh, don't go and buy, you know, if you want to have the, the, the apple pectin and the nice anthocyanidins and everything from an apple, you don't buy, you know, 
leaves or bark from the apple tree. You know, there may be something, some beneficial thing to it, but that's not what you're looking for. So I spend a lot of time on chamomile, but it's an awesome herb. Um, and you can read about it uh, through lots of different books. And you, you know, some books emphasize different things, but it's it's a, it's a great one. Now, yarrow is another herb that has a long history in herbal medicine. So it's, to the best of my knowledge, chamomile, uh, going back to the chamomile, there is German chamomile and Roman chamomile. They're slightly different in them, but they're both cousins of each other. Um, they do have overlapping phytochemicals. Um, and we've been using this in herbal medicine since, as far as I know, dates back to, to probably the Egyptian medicine, because some of the best um, chamomile tea comes from, from Egypt. So, but it does grow around here as well if you want to, if you want to grow it. Now, yarrow, it also dates back uh, to those times. I'm sure, I don't know, I haven't read any, all the ancient Egyptian texts. Uh, because I'm not really, my hieroglyphics isn't very good, but uh, when you look at the Greco-Roman medicine, the arrow was once used in by the Roman ar army when they're traveling from, uh, when the army's marching around and someone would get wounded, they would apply a arrow topically to wounds to act as a styptic to stop bleeding and also to help with wound healing. So it has that beneficial effect when applied topically um, where it's going to act as a vulnerary and help to um, uh, decrease infections and um, when you look at the compounds in yarrow some of them overlap with chamomile and so there's there it tends to be a lot more bitter than chamomile is and so um, it has more of a bitter action associated with it and that may be due to the mattress mattress and the sesquiterpene lactose as well as other things but it also contains apigenin um, and so it's not really that surprising that the indications are very similar to chamomile, slightly emphasizing more of the, uh, of the bitter action. Um, you find yarrow in certain bitter liqueurs. Uh, it still has an anti-ulcer effect and something in it has, uh, I didn't include it here. I don't think, it, uh, but it can uh, it can be used as a styptic. Styptic is to, to arrest bleeding uh, or a hemostatic. You could add that if you wanted to. I might just add it right now. Hold on. Oops. Uh, so hemostatic and styptic. Uh, you won't need to know that directly on the exam. So scribble it in there, but. It's not on the slide. I, probably, I didn't ask a question directly on that. I may say it was used as, you know, it could be used for wounds or whatever because of the anti ulcer effects. Um, so with yarrow, um, I would use that internally for uh, stomach ulcers, for inflammation. Uh, it's also used in traditional herbalists for things like uh, colds, blood pressure. I know that apigenin has some blood pressure lowering effects and so even celery uh, which has other compounds have contains apigenin and that seems to uh, maybe related to why celery can be used for blood pressure I'm sure chamomile and yarrow and uh, uh, and the uh, celery all have overlapping actions but then they have their own unique things going on as well and so you know how would you use yarrow over chamomile I don't like the taste of yarrow as much as a tea, but I would maybe use more of it uh, in tincture form, potentially. Um, I might use it if there was maybe also a blood pressure issue going on as well. Uh, maybe if I thought there was some more bleeding, I think it may be better for wound healing uh, and bleeding, uh, if there's bleeding going on, maybe because there's more tannins. I don't know if there's you know, how, how astringent it is, relatively speaking, but it is different. It does have more of that wound healing sort of side of it. Uh, but they both are kind of, it's hard for me to say which one would be superior because there's no head-to-head -head comparison. So a lot of the indications are almost identical. There is a little bit more astringency to it, I find. Um, but yarrow and chamomile are in the same family. They're both in the Asteraceae family. They are cousins of each other. So 
they're going to be very, very similar, similar in actions because of their uh, phytochemicals. So I think on an exam, it would be pretty hard for me to get you to try to give me, you know, what's the difference between yarrow and chamomile. Like it would be hard um, because they are very, very similar. Okay. Uh, Xavier is asking, could you use it for leaky gut types of things and internal bleeding? I think so. And that's why, like, no one's ever done a study using Yero for Crohn's or for uh, peptic ulcers or for uh, dysentery. But those would all be things that I think would be indicated. You could use a herb like Yero internally when there's blood in the stool associated with those serious inflammatory issues going on. Uh, uh, Laura is saying something interesting there. Uh, in traditional Transylvanian herbalism, I don't know anything about Transylvanian herbalism. It sounds scary though. Um, Yarrow is recommended for female reproductive issues. It regulates the menstrual cycle. Yep. Yeah. And again, both chamomile and yarrow has beneficial effects on uh, uh, on uh, menstrual issues as well because of the antispasmodic effects. Uh, because it can help uh, reduce bleeding that's associated with the menstrual cycle. But I'm only focusing mainly on the digestive stuff and then kind of mentioning other things. And some other tradition may um, uh, may mention other indications that I'm not even aware of. And, you know, science might back that up one day as well. Uh, so again, I can't expect you guys to memorize everything. What I would do is... Knowing the fact that it has the flavonoids and the sesquiterpene lactones, and when I mentioned the apigen that has that antispasmodic effect associated with it, uh, you can deduce some of these other things. I didn't mention here that it was used for anxiety as an anxiolytic. I use chamomile more for that. I'm sure Euro probably has a slight anxiolytic effect. Sometimes herbs that I don't even, I was never taught that they can help with depression or anxiety. Turns out that they can't. Um, what precisely in Yarrow is used for uh, as a hormone regulator? I don't know if it regulates periods or if it just helps. Like there's hormone regulators that directly affect hormones. I don't know if it affects the hormones or if it affects more uh, like acts as a uterine tonic to improve uh, the tonicity of the uterus and to arrest bleeding that way by maybe through some of the tannins and stuff like that. So, uh, but I don't know. I don't know how it, if it if it how it works out through that mechanism. Now, one thing with uh, chamomile tea is I find that when you drink it alone, it's not always that agreeable. So some people might have to add some honey to it. Um, but another thing you can do if you don't want to add honey to it to make it more palatable is get people to add peppermint to it. Now, peppermint's an amazing herb, standalone herb by itself. Most people think that. Uh, the essential oils are the primary phytochemicals responsible for its medicinal benefits. But again, I think like most things, whole plants have a lot of stuff going on it. And uh, there are going to be monoterpenoids uh, that we know about, like menthol is the main flam um, uh, essential oil in peppermint. And we know that for menthol, uh, a couple of things that it does is it, acts as a carminative because it's a, like most essential oils. We also know that it binds to cold receptors in the, uh, in the skin. And so when you look at a lot of sport creams that contain peppermint oil or menthol, it has that cooling effect so that um, uh, most sports medicine or, or Vicks Vapor Rub or, or those types of things have that cooling action. It's not that they make you cold, what they do is they just stimulate those cold receptors that make you perceive that area as being cold. And so externally it does that. Now internally what's interesting, it can have that cooling effect as well. Uh, just like if you, uh, some people they eat a lot of spicy food, uh, they feel the heat when they eat it and they also feel the heat when it goes out of them. Uh, that's just because um, the uh, capsaicin, the, uh, the spicy component, uh, will uh, will stimulate those hot receptors and make them feel uncomfortable. Okay, so with peppermint, the essential oils will give it its carminative effect, 
And they also will have some analgesic effect. And we know that with peppermint oil, there's been some studies done with peppermint oil capsules that have shown benefit for relieving intestinal pain. And it could be through relaxing smooth muscles through the carminative action and the antispasmodic effect, effects, uh, effects. Maybe it's also by through its mechanism of how, just like how it reduces pain when applied topically to your skin, it can reduce muscle pain. Maybe when you apply it topically to your intestinal tract, it distracts some of those pain signals that normally reach the brain uh, and changes it so that it dampens them. Because sometimes what happens when you apply um, distracting sensations to the skin, um, normally the pain's going up. If, you, if you're itchy or you've got pain, if you scratch it or you apply heat or you apply cold to it, it overrides the pain signal so it no longer gets to the brain. So as a result, it dampens that pain response. So maybe that's how peppermint works uh, and acts as a bit of an analgesic. So peppermint oil capsules, I've used them for certain people for um, intestinal pain, but you could use peppermint tea and chamomile tea as well. The thing is, is some people don't like drinking teas and they want a pill. And so in that case, I might give them peppermint oil capsules and it may have other things in it. Um, there's a product that I use that contains oregano oil and peppermint oil. And so I use it for intestinal pain, but I also use it as an antimicrobial. Sometimes I think these essential oils could dis dis uh, uh, disrupt uh, biofilms that some bugs can form as well and have an uh, antiseptic effect in the gut. Um, so lots of good things. Peppermint tea doesn't have as many, like the concentration of the essential oils is much lower in the tea than you would get in a capsule. So again, you're kind of getting more of a drug-like action when you take peppermint oil capsules because you have concentrated high amounts of something. And when you concentrate and get high amounts of one thing, you're also losing other things. So peppermint oil capsules will not have the flavonoids that you get associated with peppermint tea. And those flavonoids, drinking herbal teas in general will have, it's like eating more vegetables, you know, it's good for you. Um, so when it comes to, oh, I forgot to go back to um, artichoke, so we'll skip back to that in a second. Um, so when you look at um, peppermint, I would say it's primarily used for cramping and gas in the intestinal tract. So let's say if you ate a whole bunch of beans for lunch and you're feeling a little bit bloated, then I would take, uh, maybe drink some peppermint tea. Um, it also has an anti-emetic effect. Now, even smelling certain essential oils like peppermint oil can help relieve nausea. So not only does drinking it help, but if someone was going in for surgery and their doctor said you can't take anything orally and even though peppermint tea probably wouldn't cause any harm and they're feeling nauseous, you can at least get them to smell peppermint. Um, so it helps with that. It does help promote digestion through its carminative effect. So those essential oils are going to increase blood flow. Some of the flavonoids in it, I'm sure, have beneficial effects. And there's probably other compounds I don't even know about that have some effect. So it's used um, also carminative, antispasmodic, helps with gas, helps with flatulence, helps with cramping pain. There's going to be some mild anti-inflammatory effects. It's sometimes combined uh, either with other herbs or taken as like a cough drop. So menthol is a common like component in uh, various cough drops and it does have an anti effect. So it helps reduce coughing and also emesis. So I don't know exactly what its mechanism is for that. Uh, but when you think about, just as an aside, when I think about uh, Ipecac or Indian tobacco, Lobelia, the fact that they can be used primarily in large amounts to induce vomiting and in smaller amounts to help uh, expectorate things. Uh, they have that affinity for the lungs. It's interesting that peppermint may have a suppressive effects on uh, the cough reflex and uh, vomiting, maybe through a similar mechanism, I'm not sure. Now with any herbs that contain essential oils, you need to be cautious when people have reflux. And so the essential oils have that sphincter relaxing property. Now what I see is that when things are combined with a bitter, 
there seems to be less of a, like the bitters tend to tighten sphincters. So a bitter component will do that while the sphincter orals kind of relax it. And sometimes peppermint can be used for heartburn and can be beneficial uh, through certain mechanisms, but the essential oil in high amounts would likely cause heartburn if it's related to gastroesophageal reflux disorder, where it's a more of a sphincter issue. And so if you go on Google and Google heartburn, peppermint may come up as a remedy for heartburn. But again, it could both potentially harm and help heartburn. It's kind of confusing. Um, so peppermint, we all often will serve peppermint, chamomile and peppermint tea in the waiting room because it's calming, it tastes nice. A lot of people have digestive issues when they come in. It's very mild. Um, inexpensive. Uh, I'm a big fan. I use. I don't often use peppermint in tincture form just because it's more cost effective to go with it as a tea form, but I do use peppermint oil capsules sometimes. I would say the primary indication is going to be as a permittive. Uh, Mary is asking, what do I use to regulate periods, menstrual periods? Vitex. That's it. Uh, unrelated. Now let's see. Uh, I'm going to do fennel and then I'm going to jump back to artichoke in a second. So when you look at peppermint, peppermint is in the mint family. No surprise there. Okay. Uh, that's the labiaceae family. Other herbs in the peppermint family include things like spearmint, uh, oregano, rosemary, thyme. All those herbs contain various essential oils. And I would say that they all have a permanent effect. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of them have an antimatic an effect. I'm sure most of those have an antispasmodic effect. Some of those may have an anti-inflammatory effect. I'm not sure if they have an anti effect. Not all of them stimulate those cold receptors. So there's going to be overlap there, but they're not all going to be the same. Now, when I look at fennel, fennel belongs to the APACA family. And they all have this very distinctive umbrella-like uh, fluorescence to it, like the, the floral uh, pattern to how the flower and the seeds are, are lined up. And so this includes members of like fennel and anise, which are, in my opinion, could be used interchangeably in practice. So fennel and anise, but also things like caraway, uh, celery seed, um, which other ones? Uh, cumin, uh, most of the ones that have a whole bunch of small little seeds like that. The list is long. I just can't think of too many because I'm a little bit sleepy prior today. Now, fennel has that distinctive black licorice-like taste associated with it. Um, and that's due to the anethol. Okay, that little compound there gives it the black licorice taste. Anethol is also going to be found in anise. So the uh, it's a cousin of, of fennel. So when you have things like Zambuca, uh, it's either going to be, it's often predominantly anise that's in it with some fennel. Uh, but from a herbal standpoint, anise and fennel are the same. Same family, you use the same part of it, you use the seeds, primarily in herbal medicine, and they're rich in the same phytochemicals. So those two herbs are identical, in my opinion, as far as indications go, or almost identical. Now, someone could argue, oh, well, you know, ignoring this small component of it, but, and that may be true, but I'd say I need to look at similarities to try to group things together because I can't remember 500 herbs with everything unique, so I try to group them together. So fennel and anise, the fennel proteins are the, is the anthol compound and it's in the essential oil component because it's an essential carminative, antispasmodic, anti-inflammatory. Now, there are some other things that also acts as an expectorant. So in addition to digestive things, it's sometimes it's used uh, for, I'll throw it in a cold remedy, for, especially with kids if you want to get a little bit of flavoring into it. It also has some interesting properties where this anethyl compound, I think it modulates um, uh, dopamine receptors uh, in the pituitary gland to have a hormone regulating effect because it does seem to have some that hormone regulating effect. I don't know if it directly acts on the phytoestrogen or if indirectly it modulates hormones to have that effect. But we know that fennel tea is something that historically was used by nursing women 
to promote blood flow. So there's a uh, not blood flow uh, um, to increase milk production. So a galactagogue is one of the ways is the term used as a as to, in, to induce lactation or promote la uh, milk production. Um, so both fennel and anise, you can find it in liqueurs. You can also find fennel uh, root is often eaten as a vegetable. So it's you'll see it kind of like you can buy celery root as well. You just basically buy the oh I gotta sneeze and I'm put on mute for a second. Sorry about that. Um, so you can eat it as a vegetable. When you eat it as a vegetable, you probably are going to be getting a lot more phenolic compounds in it uh, and less of the essential oils, relatively speaking. Um, but um, you would still get a slight carbonate effect by eating eating the, the root. And certainly, if you cut the root and eat or eat the uh, the uh, fennel root raw, you can taste those essential oils, and it has that nice black licorice taste to it. Um, so fennel, you also find it's historically used in gripe water, gripe water. So gripe means cramping. So gripe water was used for colic, like colicky, uh, 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 infants with colic, digestive upset. Um, uh, you can find gripe waters in the pharmacy, uh, that, uh, contain fennel in it. Okay. Some cautions with it, you may want to be careful giving it during pregnancy for a couple of reasons. I think these essential oils do get passed into the breast milk and in high amounts that may not be desirable. Um, breastfeeding, I think I was reading there's some cautions where it may be harmful in high amounts to children. So that may have some neurotoxin issues if you take too much of it. So I'm not concerned with a little bit, but it's just sort of in the back of my mind. So some people don't recommend using it. With children and other people do recommend it so it's a bit confusing what to do about that so um and fennel one of the indications that health canada has given fennel for is for menstrual issues and regulating menstrual issues so that could be used as one thing to regulate periods uh and it might be combined with other things like um uh, vitex uh and some other herbs as well um, um, Don Kwai as well and so I've used formulas like that for hormone regulation for sure but we're focusing on only the digestive issues and so I'm trying to emphasize the things that you have that are important using the bolding okay let's go back poor globe artichoke okay it's getting neglected here so globe artichoke the primary indication that I think of with globe artichoke is the benefits that it has on the cardiovascular system. And it has an important effect on uh, lowering cholesterol. And that's kind of a classic herbal remedy. Like if you learn, remember one thing about globe artichoke is it helps to lower cholesterol. And it also helps prevent atherosclerosis. So the way that it helps prevent heart disease is not just through lowering cholesterol, but it's loaded with antioxidants that can help protect the cholesterol from being oxidized and it also has things that help to reduce um, inflammation. So globe artichoke is often used more as a cardiovascular herb, but like um, dandelion, like chicory, not like wormwood, I guess kind of like wormwood, but there's also overlapping actually with chamomile and yarrow because it's in the same family. Uh, well, wormwood's in that family too. Who else is in there? They're not these guys. So wormwood, chicory, dandelion, globe artichoke, chamomile, yarrow are all in the Asteraceae family. Now, in the Asteraceae family, you either get that classic daisy little flower, the aster looking one, like the one that you see with with the chamomile and the fever few. And you know, you can see it also in the arrow here. It's a little bit smaller, so it's harder to see. Or you get the thistles, and this would include things like burdock and artichoke. So it's more of that thistle-like sort of look to it. Um, in herbal medicine, all these leaves are used. You can also eat it, eat it as a food, but you're only usually eating the small inner white part here because the rest of it is a bit tough. 
A globe artichoke is great because easy to grow, relatively inexpensive, and it's loaded with great phytochemicals. And so as a capsule or as a tincture or as a, uh, you can even make a tea out of leaves, although it's not as tasty as some, uh, as some teas out there, um, you get a lot of the benefits. So we know that it contains apigenin, which is what we talked about when we discussed the chamomile and the, and the uh, yarrow. So that compound's coming up again. We know, as we mentioned earlier, it lowers blood pressure. We know that it has some antioxidant effects. And what's interesting is we know that um, chamomile appears to have some anti-diabetic effects and cholesterol-lowering effects. Um, even though I don't usually think of chamomile as being that primary indication, but globe artichoke has that as well. They both contain some type of sesquiterpene lactone and some type of flavonoids with overlapping uh, same types like apigenin. So with globe artichoke, it has a positive effect also on diabetes and heart disease. I don't think it wrote down anti-diabetic there, but I've been reading some studies on that. Um, it is bitter. It doesn't taste as bitter as gentian is. The sesquiterpene lactone is in it. The cyanide rub P. Crin, I don't know, I don't know, I, try to, I, I never try to pronounce it in advance. Anyways, that septoterpene lactone there uh, likely is going to have that digest, digestive bitter effect. It's going to get the bile flowing, and with that, you can help push out some of the cholesterol that could be in the liver. And you're also uh, going to be stimulating appetite. Um, and it does appear to have both hepatoprotetic protective effects and cholesterol lowering effects. Um, so in addition to using this for lowering cholesterol, you could use it as a digestive bitter, but it's not my go-to digestive bitter, but I will use it in formulas when I have, when I want digestive bitters and I want that hepatoprotective effect and cholesterol lowering effect. That's where, where I do use globe artichoke is when people have fatty liver disease, which is usually a disease where uh, when it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and they don't have a viral infection, it's usually because they basically have been overeating too much sugar or fat and they have a genetic predisposition and they basically, their liver becomes infiltrated with fat and their cholesterol is usually elevated, their blood sugar is usually off, they tend to be overweight. And so I've used a little artichoke combined with other herbs uh, to get the fat out of the liver and to help to normalize liver enzymes. And uh, I've had success uh, with that. I'll tell you about those next week. So antioxidant, but you know, that's a useless thing to memorize because they, almost every single herb has a, some level of antioxidant properties to it. Bitter component. <clears throat> Again, if it's got sesquiterpene lactones, it's got bitters in it. So you don't really have to, you know, if you, if you remember that, just remember it has the sesquiterpene lactones. And even though I'm not asking you to memorize the family, all these come from the Asteraceae family, and I don't think it'd be hard not to find a member of the Asteraceae family that doesn't have sesquiterpene lactones in it. And because it's a bitter, you get the stomachic, the cholagog, choleratic effects. It has an affinity for the liver uh, and does lower cholesterol. So lots of cool things with it, okay? Uh, just by eating... Uh, just by... So do you get the benefits from eating the whole artichoke? You can. The problem is, is that it's very fibrous. So the amount that you usually dip in butter and you know scrape off the leaves with your teeth or the artichoke hearts, they will have these desirable compounds in it. Um, but doing an extract, you know, as a tea or some other kind of as a tincture, you might be getting a more concentrated amount of these active ingredients. Uh, do I use it as a pill or as a food? I sometimes recommend it as a pill. Uh, it's not an easy food for people to eat on a daily basis. Unlike getting someone to eat carrots or eat arugula or um, apples or drink chamomile tea, it's not quite as easy. So I tend to use it mostly in practice uh, in, when I do it with a tincture form, okay? I'm not saying that's the best way to do it, but that's just how I do it. Uh, by eating the whole artichoke, you get the benefits for the liver. Yep, you do. The only problem with that is, again, um, 
It's not something that's easy to eat on a daily basis. It tends to be expensive, but you can buy a couple of these artichokes and then uh, make your own tincture with it, and you're going to be getting lots of the of the phytochemicals that way. And then you can take just a little spoonful here and there and get the benefits. Okay. So I don't think artichoke, when I've looked at the research, I don't think taking globe artichoke alone for the benefits for cholesterol um, would be sufficient if someone had really, you know, moderately high cholesterol. Like it's not as strong as a statin. Uh, it may not lower it as well as the statins does, but at least it's protecting uh, your arteries as well. But appreciate if someone's having low artichokes, um, that wouldn't be the only thing. I would be telling them also reduce your meat consumption. So that's going to be saturated fat from either meat, eggs, and dairy. I would be doing that. I'd be saying just eat more vegetables in general. Uh, limit uh, processed food or eliminate it altogether. Uh, don't add refined sugar to things. Like that's kind of what I would do. And then the globe artichoke may or may not be necessary. I don't always add the herbs in right away in tincture or pill form. Because if I can resolve the problem with diet alone, then that's ideal. Or sometimes we'll add them in while we're getting the diet under control so we get fast results to gain their confidence, and then we can always remove it later on. But the goal is not to have people on uh, taking pills and potions and, and tinctures and everything else for the rest of their life. Um, but at least I do feel more confident with people taking tinctures or whole herb extracts long term than taking an isolated uh, compound, okay? So let me skip back ahead to Garden Angelica. So Garden Angelica, um, or Angelica Arch Angelica, this grows in Northern Europe. We have a lot of plants that look very similar to Garden Angelica that grows in North America. One of them's called uh, uh, Giant Hogweed. Uh, so it looks, a lot alike, but it's smaller. Um, Don Kwai, which is Angelica Arch uh, Angelica sinensis, is used in Asian medicine. They have very similar phytochemical constituents, um, and they have similar actions. I would say Garden Angelica is used in traditional herbalism more as a uh, digestive tonic and it has an affinity for the respiratory tract. So they used to use it for uh, infections as well. Like uh, it's a remedy that's used for the bubonic plague. I uh, don't know how effective it was. I've never treated anyone with the bubonic plague. Um, I would probably tell the person to take antibiotics, which have been effective, uh, probably more effective than Garden Angelica, but something to keep in mind there. And, um, so when I, and I think that in when I look at uh, Angelica sinensis, which is Don Kwai, which is used in herbal in uh, traditional uh, Chinese medicine, that Don Kwai is used primarily as a basal dilator. Uh, it helps increase blood flow to the pelvic region, and so it's used mainly for menstrual cramps uh, as a female tonic to increase libido because it increases blood flow to the pelvic region. Uh, also. Um, Angelica sinensis is also used for lowering blood pressure and also for uh, angina and um, a number of other cardiovascular issues in men. So the reason why I'm telling you that is there seems to be a lot more research on Angelica sinensis than there is in Angelica arch Angelica. And because they have similar overlapping phytochemicals, I wouldn't be surprised if the indications are the same. Okay. So the difference is garden, uh, garden Angelica grows in Northern Europe primarily, and also you can get it in Scandinavian countries, Iceland. Uh, it probably grows in North America. I don't, I don't think I've seen it wild here. Um, um, and when you look at the liquor industry, it's found a lot of different formulas, including like herbal drinks, including things like chartreuse. If you've ever had that, it's one of the constituents in that. Sometimes a lot of the other things like absinthe, even though wormwood is the main thing in absinthe and wormwood and anise or fennel is the main thing in, in absinthe, but they may sneak into that. Uh, 
I like gin, so I've been reading my bottles of gin, and sometimes I'll notice they'll have they'll include garden angelica in that. And garden angelica is kind of an interesting when you look at it as a digestive tonic. It does contain bitter constituents and also essential oils, so it's kind of an aromatic bitter where it has that dual effect. Wormwood has both essential oils and and uh, bitter constituents in it as well, while gentian, which may have some essential oils in it, I, I kind of consider it to be much more of a, of a pure bitter, where it's got a lot of bitter constituents and less of a carminative action associated with it. So, um, I use this, I, I, I can't say that it, it makes sense to use this over one other digestive bitter or herb. Um, you will learn about it during the rest in the respiratory tract as well. It may exert some influence on the female uh, menstrual cycle. So knowing that it's a cousin of um, Don Kwai, if I was had a woman who was coming in with uh, menstrual cramps, you know, I might use that sort of the, in the back of my mind and throw it into a formula for a woman who had digestive issues and was getting bad menstrual cramps, and you know, throw it in with fennel and some other things that kind of have that dual action. Uh, to see if I can get some benefit from it. Now, like any um, herb that's rich in essential oils, you have to be cautious when people have uh, reflux. Um, going back up to the fennel, uh, as an example, I remember, I may have mentioned last week, I can't remember, I had Zambuca or something like that after I had a big meal with my, uh, my, uh, my in-laws. And they were serving Zambuca, so I said, sure, I'll take a shot. And I drank some of that, which I like the taste of. Now, the problem with Zambuca is a lot of sugar in it, so it's definitely not good for you to have some of these liqueurs where they may have bitter or carminative actions, but it's pretty thick and syrupy, and the sugar in there is pretty strong. And so um, I did overeat, and sugar helps relax the lower esophageal sphincter. Essential oils relax the lower esophageal sphincter. And I remember, I guess I was slow to digest my food and I burped in the middle of the night and I just tasted all the acid flowing up into my mouth. And so um, that can happen. You gotta be careful about taking a lot of carminatives when you have a really full stomach right before bed, okay? Uh, oh, and just as an aside, Garden Angelica. When you look at the structure, it has that umbrella-like structure. It may be hard to see right there, but it is in the same family as fennel. So it's not surprising. Um, it has similar properties to some of these other herbs in that family, that like carminative action. Uh, one other thing that's worth noting, remember when we talked about the grapefruit uh, juice can inhibit liver enzymes? Uh, that's because of those foranoclumerins in it. We know that Garden Angelica has foranoclumerins in it. So one thing that I would kind of be aware of about, if someone was taking a statin drug for lowering cholesterol, I would be cautious about using Garden Angelica with them, knowing that it could elevate those drugs and other, not just statin drugs, but other drugs as well. So it's, it's on my radar. It's like, this could be a herb that could affect drug metabolism. Um, and the other thing that I have to be aware of is that other members of the uh, APAC family uh, that are similar to this, that contain pteranoclumerins, also have a photosensitizing effect. And I would be concerned that potentially Garden Angelica could have that effect as well. And so collecting it, I would be cautious and careful to make sure that if I am collecting a herb like this, to make sure that I don't get it to, to suck it, like the juice on my skin, and then be exposed to uh, sunlight. Uh, someone's asking about eating a whole artichoke for the benefits for the liver. Uh, I would, if you want to get benefits for the liver, artichoke would be one thing. Um, uh, turmeric would be another thing. Uh, milk thistle would be another thing. Uh, you can buy milk thistle seeds. Ginger benefits the liver. Lots of things benefit the liver. Now, moving on to, we're kind of out of the 
Astor family or the Astraceae family and the uh, Apiaceae family that have um, sesquiterpene lactones in, in the Astor family and then a lot of essential oils in the Apiaceae family. Now we're going back to uh, herbs that are related to uh, isoquinoline alkaloids. Now this so the isoquinoline alkaloids are found in members of the Burbidaceae family and also in the uh, Papervaceae family. So greater telonides in the poppy family, and this includes other herbs like opium poppy, California poppy, uh, bloodroot. And so they have a milky, milky latex. In the case of greater telonide, it has this nice yellowy orange color, which from a doctrine of signature standpoint, I don't know if I mentioned that earlier, doctrine of signatures is the idea that God has revealed some little secret message or maybe an also secret message uh, through something about the plant can kind of help us know what it's useful for. Now, I don't think it's uh, really a very useful thing to try to figure out what a plant does if you've never, if you know nothing about it, but it's useful to help you remember what the herb's good for. And greater chalendine is useful for liver conditions. And in the doctrine of signature standpoint, because it's yellow and it has this yellow latex in it, that's a way to remember you get jaundice if you're trying to identify it in the wild. If you get jaundice, you take something like greater chalendine uh, because it has that strong affinity for the liver. Okay. The isoquinoline alkaloids in it are cousins of uh, berberine. There is a little bit of berberine in it, but that's not the main thing. There are the chelidonine and this cup design are two things that they probably have some antimicrobial effects to it. But in addition to that, it has strong antispasmodic effects. And historically, the opium poppy, everybody knows of it as being a herb used for pain management. And we know all the dangers and troubles that... Uh, uh, opium and opioids have caused around the world. When you look at fentanyl now, which is more of a synthetic opioid, uh, it's taken it to a whole new level. Opium was dangerous enough. I don't know why we had to go and make new drugs that were even more dangerous. But So that's the opium poppy. Now, greater chalendine, it's a cousin of the opium poppy, and it has some overlapping indications in some way. It does have a little bit of an analgesic effect, but it does have primarily this antispasmodic effect associated with it. Now, with the opium poppy, it was used for pain, but it was also used for severe smooth muscle cramping. Um, and so it was used for diarrhea. So when people had cholera and they were basically losing all their, you know, dehydrating and, and, and losing all their uh, bodily fluids from that, or severe nausea or severe cramping pains in like gallbladder and other areas, um, opium could be used for that spasmodic pain. And so greater chalendine, I'm only mentioning this just because it's a cousin of it. It does have a latex. It has isoquinoline alkaloids that may bind to some of these opiate receptors or other things in the body. It may have some other actions. And so for me, greater chalendine's main indication is as an antispasmodic. It's also a bitter. These isoquinoline alkaloids are very, very bitter. And it probably promotes digestion on some level, but I don't use it as a digestive tonic primarily. That's not the main thing I use it for. We know that it has a strong affinity to, affinity to the liver and gallbladder in herbal medicine and that it helps to promote uh, bile flow. And so it's used as, a, as often as a constituent uh, in gallstone formulas when there's a lot of cramping pain associated with the gallstones. Um, it's also used in a formula that, uh, and often used in Europe for irritable bowel syndrome when it's a cramping IBS like presentation. And so it has this digestive tonic mainly focused on the gallbladder and the liver. Um, uh, and I don't really consider it to be hepatoprotective. I mean, it may have some action. I might actually consider it to be a little bit irritating to the liver. And maybe that's one of the ways that it exerts a positive effect is some of these isoquinoline alkaloids are a little bit 
annoying or irritating to the liver and therefore helps to get things moving. Because sometimes things that irritate the intestinal tract uh, exert their their effects. So, um, you know, carminatives, essential oils irritate the uh, lining of the mucous membranes and increase blood flow. And maybe the greater chalcodimes constituents irritate the liver a little bit to get things flowing, get things moving. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is when you look at PubMed, there is numerous, maybe a dozen or a ten, um, um, ten or so or a dozen uh, case reports of it causing drug-induced hepatitis. And so some authorities don't recommend using it internally. Um, and so for me, if I know that there are superior bitters that have a safer profile, like gentian is a really good one, uh, it doesn't have the isoclumin alkaloids in it. Um, I might be more inclined to go with it for digestive issues. Um, I do use chelidonium, and I have used it historically. I'd be more inclined to use it for maybe acutely for gallbladder spasms, where I want to improve the function of the gallbladder and liver, but do it for short terms until I can relieve the cramping, cramping spasmodic pain that's going on, and then switch to uh, a formula that it doesn't have the greater chalandine in it so that I reduce the risk of having any possible issues with the liver. You could also, if you wanted to give it long term, check the person's liver enzymes and then do a follow up check and just make sure that they're aware. You have to give them informed consent that occasionally causes drug induced hepatitis. So uh, if you don't want to use it, you don't have to because it's not up to you to decide what's best for the patient. The patient has to be able to give you informed consent and say, you know, I don't want to take anything that could possibly hurt my liver. It's just not worth it. Um, the other thing I'd be cautious cautious about is, and I just would not use any isoquinoline alkaloids uh, in patients that are pregnant, because I think these guys, based on their structure, have the potential to have a uh, teratogenic effect. They could slip in between the DNA of the, of the baby uh, or any other rapidly growing cells and disrupt cell growth. We know that there is an extract of greater chelidine called Ukraine, I think it's called, that's you can find out about it. it's an anti-cancer drug, extremely expensive. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever been on it, but I think in places in Europe, there are people that use it for cancer. And the fact that if it's you know, anything that's good for cancer is probably not good for babies uh, or, or developing children. So I tend to try to avoid giving these types of things to young children. Uh, as an aside also, the greater chalandine, the latex of it, does have a bit of an escoriatic effect. It kind of uh, irritates skin a bit. So when you apply it topically, it can be used to burn warts off. And so it and bloodroot, which are both in the poppy family, uh, produce a resin that you can apply topically, just as an aside. So the take home map, the take home with greater chalidine is I'm using it minimally these days. If I can use another herb instead, I will use it. And that's just my opinion. I don't, I, I don't, I know some traditional herbalists love this stuff. Um, and my concern is that if you're a traditional herbalist, you're probably not seeing thousands of patients a year. And I'm not trying to be condescending. I just don't think that most of them are busy enough in practice to see a lot of people. And so to say that they've never seen a problem, uh, it's probably accurate because they just don't see enough turnover in patients who, and also most herbalists don't take the same case that we take. Uh, they may not have access to all the blood levels. They can't make a proper diagnosis. They don't have the same medical training that we do. And so I would be concerned that um, maybe the body of evidence isn't sufficient enough for me to consider this to be safe to recommend routinely to people. Uh, and why bother if there's, if I need a bitter? This is my go-to one. Uh, but I do use it for that antispasmodic cramping effects. It also historically has been used for menstrual cramps. And so I might consider using it for that as well uh, under certain circumstances. Uh, so it's a great herb. I've used it. But because of the case reports, I have some, I have to keep that in mind. Tylenols, Tylenol is a good analgesic, but it's the number one cause of liver transplants in North America. It doesn't mean that people shouldn't use Tylenol, but you got to be careful with it. Same thing with these guys, okay? 
Uh, someone's made a comment I want to read. Laura says, uh, that's interesting. My sister used this G channel diet after hepatitis as a tea along with St. John's wort. And it restored her liver. Uh, so the question is, did, uh, just to play devil's advocate, did St. John's wort and greater Chelondine restore the liver or did the liver restore itself because of all the organs in your body, it's one of the few that can regenerate on its own and it's natural for livers to improve over time. So if someone had hepatitis, that would be someone who I'd be even more cautious about recommending greater Chelondine to just because of the way I think it could potentially cause harm. And that's just me. So I don't doubt that your sister got, got better, but we're, it's hard to make the cause and effect that this was the thing that helped her. And it may be that in a small amount, it could be helpful and in a large amount, it could be toxic. Just like a little bit of red wine is good to a little bit of red wine is good for heart disease. Lots of red wine is bad for heart disease. And that's why, um, you know, case reports, you have to consider that like, it's a case report. There's a lot of other things going on. So not enough people to make a decision on it. Okay. Um, I'm rambling on. It's 1048. Wow. Okay. Let's have a look at how many slides. We're going to stop there for a break. Uh, I don't know how many slides I've gone through here. I got lost to go through. Great. So I'm not going to post any more notes. I'm just going to keep cruising through the notes that we're doing here. And it'll take me... I'll spend an hour going through the rest of these guys here. I think that's good. So no more, I won't post anything today. And let's take a 10 minute break, back at 11, and then we'll finish everything off then, okay?
I'm just going to remind you guys, we've got a, today's Remembrance Day, so what I'll do is I'll start at 11.01. You guys can have a, uh, a little silence on your own during the break, and we'll do it. We'll start at 11.01, okay? All right, so kind of interesting that all that talk about the poppy family, the Chelidonium, that's why I remember we had Remembrance Day, so, uh, so that's why that slide was up there for a minute, in case you didn't hear me say that, okay? So, hope you had your one minute of silence. And we will move on. Let's have a little look at our... Snow's coming down out there. You guys seen lots of snow? Okay, so moving on. Um, now there's another herb that I often will use for gallbladder spasms. Um, so three herbs that I use for people with biliary colic and that's gallbladder spasms is wormwood, has a traditional indication for working on that gallbladder when there's spastic problems going on, and chelidonium, uh, greater chelidine. And the third one I often will use is wild jam. Now, the thing that I like about wild jam is I think safety-wise, it's healthier to take it long-term. 
The other beneficial effect is it may a lower cholesterol. Uh, it seems to have some cholesterol lowering effects. It may have some beneficial effects for diabetes. Um, it has the triterpenoids that are in it um, are also found in spices like fenugreek. And so I think because it helps lower cholesterol, may help with blood sugar, uh, has some positive hormone regulating effects, is more like a food than a drug and doesn't appear to have any major safety concerns, I feel a little bit more confident including this in my formulas. Wild yams used in Chinese medicine as well as uh, Western herbalism. It goes by the name of colic root as well. And so colic refers to cramping pain. And so colic root is uh, often given when people have cramping issues. So that could be menstrual cramping, digestive cramping, or cramping the gallbladder. So it has that antispasmodic effect associated with it. Um, it appears to have some anti-inflammatory effects. It may be triterpenoids exert that influence or there are other compounds in it. Um, it does seem to have an affinity for the liver um, and may have a cholagog effect as well. So it increases cholesterol excretion. I don't know how it works on cholesterol. Um, it might inhibit the synthesis or may inhibit the absorption in the, in the GI tract. Um, but... The take home from this is I think it's a safe thing to take long term when there's cramping issues going on. And I often will include it in gallstone formulas uh, and also fatty liver formulas where I'm trying to reduce the fat, get some positive effects on, on the liver um, and the gallbladder and uh, avoid potential harm. So if I can, re if I can avoid, keep the strong herbs that may have some more likely to have side effects to only a few cases, then I'm reducing the chances of causing harm to my patients, okay? So that's well, yeah. Now, milk thistle is a great herb primarily for the liver. It's, when I think of like a protective liver, hepatoprotective thing, I'm thinking milk thistle is my go-to liver herb for protecting the liver. Um, it does have some bitter effects, but it's not the major indication. Like, it's a cousin of artichoke. Uh, I don't know if artichoke has flavonolignans in it or not. Like, I know that the active ingredient in milk thistles is, are the flavonolignans. And I'm sure it has, probably has some uh, sesquiterpene lactones in it as well that give it some of the, some of its bitter properties. But it's not bitter like gentian is or some of the other digestive bitters. Um, it does increase blood uh, bile flow. Its main thing is mainly to protect the liver as an antioxidant, and it does seem to get bile flowing to some degree as well. Now, remember when we talked about in the first slides uh, how barberry contained berberine, which is the antibiotic, and also flavonolignans, and those were the multi drug resistant pump inhi uh, inhibitors. Um, milk thistle contains psilibin, which is very similar to the 5-MHC that's found in uh, the barberry families, almost structurally identical. And there's a few little extra OH groups here or a methyl group there. But the take home that I would say is that the flavonolignans in the barberry family probably has some protective effects. And presumably, psilimarin or psilibin uh, has uh, psilimarin is the name of a number of flavonolignin that includes psilibin. Um, and these compounds. Uh, appear to have some uh, that also act on multi-drug resistant pump inhibitors. And I've seen research showing benefit for taking milk thistle or certain chemotherapeutic drugs to uh, not only protect the liver, but increase the efficacy of these drugs by reducing drug resistance, which is pretty cool. Where I use milk thistle is if a patient comes in, they have elevated liver enzymes and they have um, liver uh, elevated liver enzymes, and also some cardiovascular things going on or diabetes things going on, I would include that in the formula. Milk thistle um, appears to have some positive effects on protecting your arteries because they have all these nice antioxidants in it. So liver is the main thing, but as a secondary thing, cardiovascular you know, conditions would probably benefit from it just like they benefit from our children. Uh, 
it wouldn't be the primary herb I'd use for lowering cholesterol for the for the cardiovascular system, but it, it would be something I'd consider using it, especially if there's elevated liver enzymes. Uh, another thing I might use it for is if people were taking certain drugs like Tylenol or other things that have the potential for causing drug-induced hepatitis, I might take give them uh, milk thistle with it, assuming it didn't interfere with those drugs, um, which it might, I'm assuming it wouldn't, but it, you know, it's possible they could. Um, so liver inflammation, protect the liver, uh, good for the cardiovascular system, uh, increases glutathione, helps with liver regeneration. Uh, so yeah, lots of, lots of good things. Uh, as a digestive bitter, not really. I mean, it may have some of those effects, but it doesn't taste very bitter. The lead, or the seeds is what's often used um, to get these flavonolignans from it. Maybe the whole plant has more of a bitter effect, but uh, it depends on what parts they're using for the preparation. So, so marshmallow. Marshmallow, this is actually... Um, Marshmallow, the plant, is very different than marshmallow the candy. Marshmallow candies are made primarily from probably cornstarch and sugar and, and maybe some thickening agents. But originally, the candies was a type of dessert that used the plant marshmallow. And when you take the roots and the leaves and you add water to it, you extract a lot of mucilage. And that mucilage creates this nice kind of slimy, puffy consistency that could be used to make candy. So... Now, the marshmallow candies, that probably the, the authentic original ones, uh, didn't have that nice cube form that those that the marshmallow candies have now, but they did have sort of mucilaginous uh, slime to it. Now, that mucilage is what gives marshmallow its main medicinal properties. And so where I use marshmallow root or leaves is in teas or extracts, where I perform the extract to get some nice slimy water and I sip it. And so by sipping it, you help to coat the esophagus with this supplemental mucilage, which can help with things like chronic heartburn. Um, also, it contains flavonoids, and these flavonoids probably are responsible for some of its uh, benefits as well. And I can't say for certain, but I'm assuming based on what some of the other flavonoids do in the GI tract is that they're going to have some anti-inflammatory, antioxidant effects. Maybe they're modulating stomach acid a bit. Maybe they're uh, helping speed up wound healing. Uh, they sort of roll that way. Um, so I don't want to say it's only the mucilage, but certainly the mucilage is a very important part of it. So from a herbal standpoint, it's used as a demulsion, a direct demulsion primarily because it helps to coat the esophagus, but it also exerts some influence on the lungs and it has an anti-cough, cough, anti-tussive. So because it works on the lungs, it makes me suspicious that maybe part of its demulsive effects, um, maybe it has kind of like how licorice does not contain any mucilage and the way that it exerts its effect on the mucous membranes is by stimulating mucus production. Maybe marshmallow, maybe it's got some flavonoids that have some indirect demulsion effects as well. I don't know, okay? Now, if research comes out about that, please let me know because I've been trying to figure it out for a while. Um, but historically, it's used for a demulsion, not just for the digestive tract, but also for the urinary tract. So sometimes, sometimes it's included in formulas for um, um, like chronic cystitis or irritation to the urinary tract if it's due to bacteria or, or, uh, or even little, little bits of gravel. And also for inflammation in the respiratory tract, it kind of has a nice soothing effect. So it could be used for a sore throat and also as a, as a respiratory demulsion to, uh, to help protect the mucous membranes in the lungs and, and, and calm a cough, a dry, irritated cough. Now, um, if you're trying to get the benefits of mucilage, taking it in tincture form is not going to be as cost effective, uh, or as effective in general um, as taking it as some kind of cold infusion or a tea or something like that. So when you add water to it, if I look at how much it costs, like if I buy a marshmallow for the clinic, I buy it by the pound usually. And so a pound of marshmallow 
would you can throw that into a small pool and it would turn that pool into this nice slimy water like that's like not a big pool but a small pool you could do that at least a bathtub um so for ten dollars when you buy it wholesale you're getting a lot of marshmallow mucilage that can have that beneficial effect um when you buy a marshmallow tincture in order to make a liter of herbs, you're only going to be using probably about 200 grams uh, of marshmallow, and then you have to sell it for to make a liter. Probably, you know, it's going to sell for between 50 and 100 dollars for all that for a liter. So it's not really that cost effective, and it's pretty concentrated. You don't even need the alcohol to do the extraction for the mucilage. You would. The flavonoids are somewhat water soluble, so there will be more soluble in an alcohol extract than in a water extract. But uh, I think it's totally acceptable to use marshmallow and also slippery oil that we're going to talk about in a second for uh, in powder form or as a tea form or added to water, however, to do your extract and then sip it through the day. Now, that being said, Sometimes I might throw a little bit in a formula just to give it a little bit of slime, just to kind of have a little bit of a protective effect. I don't know if there's enough in it to be worth it. Maybe it's a bit of a waste. Uh, I know my kids had a, uh, a cold on the weekend, and I had a formula that I made that had a little bit of marshmallow just to kind of help soothe a little bit. And then I had some licorice and a couple other things in it. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. They'll drink both the three-year-old and the one-year-old. They'll if I give them, they'll, they'll just drink milliliters of tincture and they they love it because the, uh, uh, because the licorice uh, makes it taste like candy. My daughter loves it. Even though I have a very, very strong bitter herb in it, you throw in a little bit of licorice in it, makes it taste nice. And then the mucilage in the marshmallow kind of helps make it a little bit slimy and, and um, feel good going down as well. So, but again, I tend to prefer using more of a, uh, um, teas and decoctions and uh, to extract mucilage than, than tinctures, okay? Now, slippery elm. Slippery elm is, in some ways, it's in some ways better and worse than marshmallow. To me, they're both pure mucilage, mucilaginous herbs. They're indirect, or they're direct emulsions. They both, when you add water, make slime. Uh, slippery elm was used uh, by early settlers, not just as medicine, but also as a gruel in the wintertime because slippery elm trees uh, grow in North America around this area. And they, um, when you take the inner bark from it and you scrape it out and you add water, it can, you can get a porridge. And that porridge can be nutritive. They can actually sustain you and, and, and keep you alive. And so it's used when people were starving, but it can also be used when people are convalescing from a serious digestive issues, adding a little bit of this and making a porridge or maybe adding a little bit of this to oatmeal can help make something that's mucilaginous, protective for the insides, uh, can help to reduce inflammation, help the gut heal up a bit, uh, and great from that standpoint. The primary thing in this mucilage, there, are, there will be some tannins in there as well, but mucilage is going to be the primary thing that you're going to have in there. Um, when I look at slippery elm compared to marshmallow, the main differences between the two is I would say that slippery elm tends to gel up, tends to thicken, tends to become that semi-solid sort of state uh, much more than marshmallow. Marshmallow, it doesn't thicken up into jello as well as slippery elm does, in my opinion. And so if you add a teaspoon of each to some water, um, if you overdo the marshmallow, it'll become thick, but it won't solidify. If you overdo the slippery elm, they won't be able to drink it because it'll just it'll just turn into a jello, okay? And so the benefit of that is also, um, you know, you can eat it as a porridge. Um, you can take it as a capsule as well. You just make sure you drink enough water with it. Uh, the disadvantage is you got to make sure you have the right dose. You can't just wing it and make up a number and give it to them and because otherwise they add it to a half liter of water, it'll thicken up too much. The main concern that exists with slippery elm is that 
Elm trees in North America got hit with Dutch elm disease, and slippery elm is, uh, uh, they're around, I, I see them quite a bit, but they're not as abundant as other trees. And one of the concerns is that, depending on how people harvest the slippery elm, you do have to damage a tree to some degree uh, to obtain it. And I think if it was done responsibly, you could probably get a little bit every year and not and be able to have a sustainable um, uh, supply of slippery elm. Um, but that's something you need to look into depending on where you're getting it from. Well, marshmallow, it grows like a weed, it's easier to grow. So from an environmental standpoint, marshmallow is better. From, but slippery elm does have some useful qualities. So I have both in the clinic, I use them both. Uh, I'm aware that slippery elm, there's some conservation issues with it. Um, you know, if they were clear cutting slippery elm trees to get the, the active ingredients, I wouldn't be using them. But I do think people are trying to be responsible gathering, but maybe I'm naive, okay? Oh, the other thing I'll say about slippery elm is that because it has that strong bulking agent of the mucilage, you can use it also as a bulking agent as well for for constipation. There are other ones that I would use, so that's why I didn't highlight it there, but that's a secondary indication. I would be more inclined to go with something like flaxseed, which flax, this is like my one of my number one favorite herbs, plants, foods ever, because it's got so many awesome things going on with it, and it's dirt cheap, okay? So flax, there are a few different things going on with it. Uh, one, it's got the lignans, and the lignans get metabolized by your gut bacteria to form enterolactone, which acts as a phytoestrogen to prevent breast cancer and prostate cancer. That's pretty awesome. The other thing is because it has those lignans, those lignans are polyphenols. When they get absorbed and when they get metabolized, they, um, and don't forget, uh, your, your gut bacteria will metabolize it to enterolactones, but they'll also, other smaller phenolic compounds will get released in, not just the polyphenol, but little ones, so that although we might think of the enterolactones as being the primary uh, active ingredient, there are other things that are byproducts that kind of created by the liver and get created by the gut bacteria that are also going to exert some um, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. And I think that measuring the blood levels of only the enterolactone, or in the case of turmeric, measuring only the um, blood levels of curcumin, could be misleading of the benefits because I don't think it's just one compound. I think it can be metabolites of those compounds that can have a positive effect. So you get the phytochemicals that have um, anti-estrogenic effects, antioxidant effects, anti-inflammatory effects, blood pressure lowering effects. Then you've got the mucilage, which is the fiber component that can help uh, act as a bulking agent and also coat your intestinal tract and have a nice soothing effect that way. Um, because of that bulk laxative effect that I included, yeah, good. Uh, it can have an anti-diarrheal effect. So, uh, um, um, flax has that, um, um, benefit for both constipation and diarrhea. So it has a normalizing effect on the bowel. And the other thing is you're feeding your gut bacteria with not just the fiber, but also with the polyphenols. And that's really important. And probably, I think feeding your gut bacteria is even more important than taking a probiotic. Um, because you want to, you know, what, what's going to live in you and last in you is dependent more on what environment, like the, their food versus what you just take, take as a pill. Uh, if you eat McDonald's and take a probiotic, um, you won't have a very good gut flora. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, I've got a few questions here. I jumped ahead through. Uh, if the mucus becomes a gel and coat the mucous membranes and the tannins stream the GI tract, would these two actions counteract each other? Um, okay, that's a good question. With the astringent in the slippery elm, it's not, it's not like astringent like oak is. Like it's just slightly astringent. Um, and a lot of herbs are a little bit astringent. So it's, it's not like a major strong suppressive effect compared to other astringents. That's why it's not really a bold thing. So it's just more of a gentle astringent. Um, someone loves slippery elm for IBS. Good. Um, it's one of many good things. Uh, are you 
Oh, you get the same effects with ground flats. Uh, so, same effects as what their gem. Cooper Smith. What are you talking about? You get the same mucilaginous effects as Slippery Elm. And the other? Possibly. I don't know what you're saying. Why, if someone something is a bulk last, can it also be the anti-diarrheal? Uh, I may have mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again because I think it's important to know. Put your hand out, pour a glass of water in your hand, or pour a glass of jello in your hand. So when you add a bulking agent to your body, it absorbs water and turns into jello. And so it becomes thick, almost like a gel. So now, if you're trying not if you're trying, if you have jello in your intestines, it moves slower through the intestines and it's less, and your sphincters can contain jello better than it contain uh, water. So when you have liquid diarrhea uh, and you're moving through your system really fast, it can be hard to control that while adding a, a, a bulking agent like psyllium or flax and things like that will solidify and turn jello to some degree that you get better bowel control. So by expanding in the lumen of the bowel, it promotes peristalsis, and with diarrhea, it expands, absorbs water, and it helps to slow the movement down because it's retaining the water better, okay? <clears throat> there is some caution that flax should be used with caution in uh, pregnant women because it's a phytoestrogen. I don't know how much of a concern that is. I think people get a little bit freaked out when they hear phytoestrogen, and, uh, I'm not concerned about it. I think both my children were exposed to dietary lignans in their diet when my wife was pregnant, uh, and uh, everything turned out all right. So, but if a study comes out showing differently, I'll change my recommendation. So, psyllium seed husk. This saved me when I had giardia in India, and this is a great bulk laxative and it's great for diarrhea it's also the main ingredient in uh lots of uh bulk laxative products on the market like metamucil um so the main thing that is used for is to promote regular bowel movements through that bulking agent it absorbs water stimulates stress receptors and gets things moving along the average North American diet has very, very little fiber. Some people hope they get less than five or 10 grams a day of fiber. And then I heard someone talking about on the weekend when I was at a trade show or sorry, at the convention, you know, some people even think that early humanoids were getting, you know, over 200 grams of protein a day, which I don't know what they're eating. They get 200 grams of protein, but uh, that certainly may be the case. So I think you need more than, two grams and probably less than 200 grams. That's for sure. Uh, I'm thinking somewhere between 30 and 50 grams of uh, fiber would, would be great to aim for. So eating flaxseed in the morning is one way to do that. Eating chia seeds, eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, you're probably going to get your necessary uh, fiber. And if you're not, I don't think that fibers, a lack of fiber is the issue, but in people that aren't eating enough fiber or, they have acute diarrhea, I would recommend psyllium seed husk to them, even chronic diarrhea. Now, I find the disadvantage of psyllium over, let's say, slipperium, you could use both for IBS. Sometimes psyllium's a bit gas-forming, can be a little, make people bloat a little bit more. I find le people complain less from slipperium than from um, psyllium. Psyllium's a lot cheaper, though, and easier to find, and you don't have the environmental concerns that you have with slipperium. So you kind of have to balance those two things. There are some products on the market that have both slippery almond and marshmallow and psyllium in it, and they're actually really, really good products, and I've used those lots. Um, so in general, your main indications would be constipation, diarrhea. It may have some anti-secretory effect I was reading, and that may be why it helps also with diarrhea in addition to being a bulking agent, uh, anti-inflammatory, anti-diarrheal. Uh, there may be other compounds in the husk beyond just some mucilage, some flavonoids, and some other compounds that also have some positive effects on your gastrointestinal tract. I also like the fiber because, it, again, all these fibers feed your gut bacteria. Um, they release short-chain fatty acids that help feed your enterocytes. So both the phenolics and the fiber are good for you. Now, cautions with psyllium. There are case reports of people taking 
uh, psyllium with insufficient amounts of water and getting basically it stuck in the throat. And you get this bolus of fiber that's expanding in the throat and could cause blockage. And so the FDA warns that maybe we shouldn't be using this. And I think you should be aware of that, okay? The other concern is someone had Crohn's disease. And what can happen with Crohn's disease is that you can get the lumen of the bowel will become narrow. And so if you took a whole bunch of fiber of any sort in patients who had a lot of narrowing in their intestinal tract and had uh, uh, due to Crohn's or some other condition, taking all this fiber behind it could cause... Uh, an obstruction, and that could be a bad thing and cause a lot of pain. And I know there's, I think, one, I think there's a case, somebody was, told me a story of a naturopath who told someone with Crohn's to take a whole bunch of fiber and they got themselves into trouble because it, the patient got in a lot of pain and complained to the board. Um, but then we also know that with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, that uh, low amounts of fiber in the diet is bad. And I think, again, with Crohn's, it kind of depends on, at what point of the crown, Crohn's disease, you know, and if you don't have that narrowing going on, it's good for you. If you have the narrowing going on, it's probably bad for you, okay? And the other thing with acute constipation, in general, you don't want to take a big bowl of fiber because it's just going to make you feel awful, okay? Uh, again, I would not use slippery elm or psyllium seed husk, and you could even argue against using uh, marshmallow in tincture uh, form as well. Uh, although I do use the, tincture, the marshmallow sometimes, okay? Now, English plantain, greater plantain, uh, these are two varieties of plantain. Now, you can't see the picture very well here. Greater plantain is called Plantago magus, and English plantain is called Plantago lanceolata. Well, lanceolata refers to uh, how the uh, leaves are uh, kind of narrow and long, I guess like a lance. And Plantago major um, is grows a little low lying and the leaves are much broader. Both of these grow all around where I live. They're a common weed. You see it growing like mad in people's gardens. I don't know... I think they're both native to Europe and they were introduced to North America when the settlers came, but it's now pretty much been naturalized here. So it's, it's pretty much a North American plant. Now these are a cousin of psyllium, like Plantago psyllium is what the psyllium seed husk is. That grows all over, I think that grows more in like uh, Middle East and Asia, uh, and probably parts of Europe, but I think Maybe the English plantain, the greater plantain, grows in little cooler areas. You can use the leaf and the whole plant for its mucilage, just like you would for plantain. Most of the fiber supplements aren't made from the husk of these two species, but these are used in herbal medicine um, for ulcers. And so one of the things that plantains use used for is a, as a topical first aid remedy where you and crush up the leaf and just apply it to a wound to help with wound healing. It's also taken internally for various types of uh, infections and inflammation. So plantain syrup is often used for sore throat. So it has this nice mucilaginous uh, uh, consistency to it that can help soothe the sore throat. And then it contains a few different types of um, compounds. It has iridoids in it. Um, and this ocubin compound has anti-inflammatory effects. This is a glycoside of it here. And uh, I think this is responsible for its vulnerary anti-inflammatory components. There's a similar herb in South Africa that called the uh, um, devil's claw. And its main active ingredient also is one of these iridoid glycosides. And these iridoid glycosides have anti-inflammatory, antiviral, antimicrobial actions to it. And so historically, plantain was also used in some forms for arthritis uh, and general pain, uh, topically for wounds, and internally it can be drunk as a tea or taken in tincture form uh, to get the benefits of the acumen. And also there are some phenol compounds and phenol glycoside, like for bascoside, which has been shown to have a number of positive effects for uh, as an anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. 
And then on top of that, it has flavonoids like apigen, and remember that it has antispasmodic effects associated with it, um, and antioxidant effects. So lots of things going on here. So its main actions is helps with wound healing, and that could be partly because of the phytochemicals like these various the monoterpenoids and the phenolic compounds, but also the mucilage. So they all kind of are working synergistically, I would imagine. Uh, so it helps wound healing, decreases secretion of various things, the molson, and then anti-inflammatory, anti-spasmodic as well, anti -tussive. So if you have this in a tea form or as a powder or you throw some of that in your tincture, uh, you could use it for inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract where there could be ulcerations going on. The disadvantage of the tincture, though, is you would be losing out on all the demulsive properties, I, I think, anyways. Okay? So two common herbs that grow everywhere. It's super cheap um, to find. Licorice has a million actions and a million indications for it. With regards to what we're talking about, licorice... Um, the main thing that we want to use it for in, in the GI tract is going to be as a demulcent, okay? And unlike marshmallow and slippery elm that contains mucilage, and that's how it exerts its demulcent effects, licorice does it indirectly. Um, and I mentioned this in the earlier slides where the lycoflavonins, the main compound that you'll find in deglycerinated licorice products, that have the glycerizin removed from it and only have this compound. And this is what's responsible for stimulating certain prostaglandins that are involved with mucus production. So if you take aspirin or ibuprofen and you take it all the time, it inhibits mucus production by inhibiting enzymes that basically are responsible for maintaining mucus secretions. So licorice does the opposite. It can have this positive effect on stimulating mucus. The glycerizin in it which is a great thing. It too has some positive effects for inflammation as an antiviral and a whole bunch of stuff. So you don't have to always use DGL. Like if you're only using something for a short period of time and someone doesn't have blood, high blood pressure, I'm not worried about using licorice at all. It's only if you're using high amounts long term where you get yourself into trouble. Or if someone has unstable blood pressure and you don't want to mess around with it, then just go with the DGL because some people won't feel comfortable with it. But I often will include licorice in various formulas, whether it's for uh, stomach ulcers, but I've also used it in formulas for uh, inflammation of the liver because it has a hepatoprotective effect uh, in addition to these uh, demulcent anti-ulcer effects. Uh, licorice is commonly found in certain uh, Chinese formulas, uh, like peony and licorice is a classic Chinese formula for menstrual issues. It has uh, some calming effects, menstrual cramps, uh, and it has other phytoestrogens in it, which is different than the lycoflavone. Uh, it inhibits the breakdown of cortisol. So cortisol, I can't which one. Um, and so it helps to boost that up. So if you're adrenally fatigued, you're totally burnt out, it gives you more energy, but you can also raise your blood pressure. Um, it's been shown to have antiviral properties against a number of viruses, including influenza and SARS, where it's shown in some studies to have a better antiviral property compared to the standard antiviral drugs that were being used. So I would always use this in any kind of viral formula. And also for respiratory issues. Take home for stomach ulcers, use it as DGL if they have high blood pressure and you're worried about it. Uh, uh, stomach ulcers, heartburn, uh, leaky gut as well, you could use this for. Uh, and if you're giving them a tincture, don't be shy to throw some licorice in there, um, assuming they don't have elevated blood pressure. And again, even if you elevated the blood pressure by 10 or 20 points, if they're at 120 or 130, even 140, and you jack it up to 160 for a short period of time, I'm not concerned about it. Even 170, I wouldn't be like, oh, I'm going to kill them. But if you're starting off at unstable 150 or 170, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother using this, okay? Marigold, this is another member of the Asteraceae family. I don't know if it has any sesquiterpene lactones. That's not the one thing that I really uh, think that people focus on. The thing that people focus on with marigold is a couple things. One, that beautiful yellow and orange color are the carotenoids like lutein. Uh, and lutein is, uh, you know, it's like a cousin. Oops. 
I just turned off my webcam because it was breaking up, so you won't see me for the remaining little bit. So Marigold, um, it has carotenoids in it. They probably exert some positive antioxidant effects, but the other components in it are various triterpenoids, and most of these are going to be fat-soluble. Um, and marigolds often, or calendula, some people call it, is, uh, can be given in, do, you can make an oil extraction with olive oil with it to get the compounds out and apply it topically to sunburns and other skin issues. So it's often found in topical preparation for eczema, sunburns, cuts, wound healing, things like that. But it can also be used internally for stomach ulcers. So like chamomile, marigold is certainly indicated for those. It's not the main indication for it. It's not what I always think about using it for, but um, because it has a different types of phytochemicals in it that have an anti-ulcer effect compared to um, chamomile, I've used it in those combined marigold, chamomile, and licorice, for example, to help heal stomach ulcers, okay? Now, meadowsweet is a herb that I would say it's primary action is going to be as an antacid. It's the one herb that I think of for people with stomach ulcers where you want to decrease stomach acidity and help heal up that ulcer. Now, in general, tannins have that effect, so I do think other herbs like yarrow and chamomile and things like that can have antacid effects as well. Um, but I'm more confident, or at least this is the first herb that I learned. So the compounds in it, it contains tannins. I'm assuming those tannins have that antacid effect. It also contains salicylic acid glycosides. And what's interesting with meadowsweet is because of the content of the salicylic acid, which is the nature's aspirin, um, this is one herb that I use that contains that. So um, normally if you get aspirin, you get a stomach ulcer. So I think it's kind of ironic that meadowsweet contains salicylic aspirin but yet it's used to treat ulcers. And so it must have other things going on. That it, I don't think that the phytochemicals have been fully elucidated. I know there's tannins, I know there's salicylic acid. I suspect there's probably flavonoids that exert an influence. So it is used for stomach, uh, for heartburn. Uh, it's used to decrease stomach acid. It's used to help heal ulcers. Research shows that it has some H. pylori effects as well. And so stomach ulcers are usually caused by that bacteria, and it seems to inhibit the binding of them. Uh, it's also used for other uh, inflammatory conditions as well. So in addition to being used for stomach ulcers, it's been used for arthritis. Um, and the fact that it doesn't cause stomach ulcers and it can help with it is a positive thing. So you could use it for those types of things where you maybe want to use it for as part of an anti-inflammatory formula combined with some other herbs uh, for arthritis. Or if someone came in with an H. pylori infection, this would definitely be one of the herbs I'd include in with other antimicrobials to try to help eradicate it, okay? Agrimony is an interesting herb. It's used in both Western herbalism. I mean, you find other varieties used in other herbal traditions as well, or other um, uh, species. Um, Trying to make sense of what it's used for is the main thing. It does have a lot of tannins in it, and it also contains essential oils, some coumarins, and some other things. So in a herbal standpoint, it's used primarily as an astringent herb. It does have some bitter and anti-ulcer properties, presumably associated with these uh, tannins that are in it. Uh, I would say it probably has some carminative effects as well. Now, the tannins in it are pretty gentle. Um, I might consider using agrimony in conditions where um, there is uh, stomach ulcers, uh, diarrhea because of the astringent properties in it as well. Um, it's also been used historically for things like a grumbling appendicitis. That's kind of a, an old school, um, uh, really eclectic sort of indication that I learned about. And I don't know how it would exert that effect. Maybe the tannins have a tonifying effect, plus it has some antimicrobial effects, so maybe it's used for that. Um, so this is a herb that I, I like it. I don't use it a lot. I have to rely more on traditional indications over, uh, those based on good science. Okay.
Uh, so we talked about herbs that are rich in tannins. A lot of herbs have tannins in it, but there are some very strong astringent herbs that have more of a suppress suppressive action that I don't use regularly because um, I think the condition has to be significant enough that you use these short term or in low amounts uh, for more serious conditions, okay? And Crane's Bill is kind of a, a tannin astringent herb associated with the GI tract that it grows in North America and it's used by a lot of First Nations people uh, and then the eclectics picked it up and we've kind of adopted it as well. The other herbs that are kind of like Crane's Bill would be oak and witch hazel. And all three of these are closely enough related that the indications and the actions would be very, very similar. I don't know whether or not I could really have a good, I don't know how easy I could defend using one over the other. Um, but historically, Crane's Bill has been in some herbal formulas used as an astringent for the GI tract. So there's one called Robert's Formula, um, which contains a few different things, including Golden Seal, Slippery Elm, uh, Crane's Bill, uh, sometimes Echinacea, sometimes Polk Root, and it's used for chronic inflammation in the, in the gastrointestinal tract. There's maybe something else in there, I forgot. So Crane's Bill, where you'd use it if someone had ulcers, infection you had to you uh, uh, use, you know, acutely for diarrhea, those types of things. But because of that strong astringency, you put it in your mouth, you can feel it. Like it's it affecting your mucous membranes. It's going to affect nutrient absorption. It's going to potentially cause some cramping if you take too much. So you got to be careful about it. Um, you could use it for hemorrhoids. Someone's asking about which one would be better for hemorrhoids. I don't really know which one would be better for hemorrhoids. Um, they would both potentially, you could use either one of them. I don't know if it would make any difference at all, but I've never done a, a comparison. It may be that preparations use more... Um, with chazel or oak just because they're cheaper and easier to find. So this is a plant that grows around here. I don't see it in the wild very often. I, I, that's a, I, all these are uh, pictures I've taken, but it's a little harder to find. Uh, oh, I gotta go. I'm gonna go, you guys may get kicked out of the room. I gotta go in a little bit longer. Bilberry, take home here. This is basically blueberries that are in Northern Europe. They contain condensed tannins, these proanthocyanins, so they're eaten as a food. These condensed tannins have some stringency, and it's used historically for diarrhea in elderly and also in children. Um, and so that's it's a very gentle anti-diarrheal compound. I've used it. I haven't been overly impressed with it. Uh, but then the problem is I'm not sure if I'm even getting bilberry because there's a lot of bilberry has been adulterated with blueberries, which are not nearly as astringent as bilberry is or other kind of flavonoids or dyes and stuff like that. We'll talk about that later on. But if I were to think of one indication or remember for the exam would be for like infantile diarrhea as a gentle anti-diarrheal compound and being astringent. And because of the uh, condensed tannins, you get all these other anti-inflammatory antioxidant properties too. Ginger's is amazing. Um, I love it. I Maybe not every day, but I eat it an awful lot. The main compound in it is gingerol. This is a phenolic compound. Um, this is a larger compound. When you start adding up the carbons, this guy is probably going to be too heavy and with too many oxygens to evaporate when you boil it. So when you take ginger and you put it in some water and you boil it and your house smells nice and fresh like ginger, that's not the ginger oil compound that people are smelling. It's going to be the other essential oils like zingabirine, which is going to have a carminative action to it. But the ginger oil itself, what makes it kind of interesting is that that compound interacts with serotonin receptors to decrease nausea and vomiting. And so that's how it exerts its, its anti-emetic effects. So ginger's main indication on the digestive tract is going to be an anti-emetic it's also going to have that carminative action with the other essential oils in it. It's going to act as a uh, stomachic, so it increases uh, digestive function. It's considered a pungent bitter, and by that is unlike bitters like gentian that tastes, you know, really bitter. 
this has more of a heating warming effect that may have many overlapping qualities as the other bitters have, but I don't really think it increases stomach acid like other bitters do. I think it works by other mechanisms, but it does have a cholagog effect, so it increases bile production and bile release. These, like any phenolic compounds, going to have your antioxidant effects there, and ginger has been a number of studies I've seen shows it has some hepatoprotective effects. The final thing that's kind of a neat indication is that the 5-HT3 receptors that are, that are involved with nausea and vomiting, if you stimulate them, you get nausea and vomiting and also anxiety. And when you suppress them, you decrease uh, nausea and vomiting. And what's interesting is there is also a clinical trial that shows that ginger has an anxiolytic effect and can help with people who suffer from anxiety. So just drinking ginger tea, uh, not only does it help with your digestive tract, it can also help with uh, anxiety. It can also help with menstrual cramps. Uh, it can also help with arthritis. It can also help with migraines for migraine sufferers as well. So I use it for all of those things, and you can get it whole root powder capsules. Tincture you got to watch though, because if you put too much in, it's too spicy. It's too hot. Like it's it's too intense. So. And it can vary from dose to dose depending on who's making it. So I made the mistake before making a tincture with some ginger in it, and it was just too spicy for the person. So I tend to uh, avoid it. Turmeric is amazing because it's one of the best anti-inflammatories, antioxidant, anti-cancer. Uh, may help with things like H. pylori infections and stomach ulcers. Uh, it has hepatoprotective effects, which I should probably right in there. Uh, you know, add that in. Because I think it's not maybe the main indication, but it does have pato, oops, pato protective, pato protective effects. Uh, the carminative action is more likely to occur when you have the whole herb rather than when you just take a curcumin supplement as well. And the other thing with curcumin is that it has antidepressant effects. It may be interacting with serotonin receptors or indirectly doing it by having positive effects on uh, inflammatory, inflammatory processes in the body. So turmeric, if you had a lot of inflammation in the gut, whether it's some kind of colitis, Crohn's, uh, stomach ulcers, that's where I would use it. And because, I mean, personally, I just give people to often take powdered ginger uh, and add it to shakes or take it as a capsule. Sometimes I, sometimes I give them encapsulated versions. But one thing I want to say about turmeric, as I mentioned earlier, is that the whole herb has both carbohydrates in it that have anti-inflammatory effects along with the uh, curcuminoids in it. So... Myrrh and Indian frankincense are both resins that you can basically collect from trees. Uh, these trees grow mostly in uh, the Middle East and South Asia. So Indian frankincense from India, it's different than the frankincense that comes from North Africa. Okay, Boswellia serrata is the species. I do have some concerns about uh, over-harvesting of these, but the resins come in this sort of form, and they're rich in triterpenoids. The main one in Indian frankincense is boswellic acid. It has some antimicrobial effects, but the main mechanism is it has, exerts some important anti-inflammatory effects. And these boswellic acids appear to work by affecting um, leukotrienes, a type of inflammatory uh, mediators that are different than the prostaglandins. And there are there is at least one study that I saw that showed benefit for uh, Indian frankincense for certain inflammatory bowel disease, but it also may have some benefits for arthritis and asthma. So inflammatory conditions in general, I would probably consider using this in a formula. It's hard to get it as in a tincture, and because it's such a um, fat-soluble compound, you'd have to use a pretty high alcohol to do the extraction, but it can be done. With myrrh, myrrh is also a resin. It probably has some anti-inflammatory effects that are 
almost as good as uh, Indian frankincense, but I can't say that for certain. Its main indication is going to be as an antimicrobial. And so this is used for, in traditional herbal medicine for respiratory conditions, but also for any kind of infections and inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract. So when you look at the compounds, they don't have specific names, but these are something called foranosesquiterpenoids, are some of the main compounds in myrrh that's in the resin. There are other things in that as well, some other essential oils, and probably longer ones, but those are some of the compounds that seem to be uh, most likely responsible. They appear to have anti-protozoal effects and also anti-parasitic effects. And uh, it appears to work against trichomonas infections that can cause uh, certain types of vaginal infections. I think there's an anti jardy effect with these, um, and uh, they're used for uh, traditionally for, for example, with strep throat. There's a formula that contains called hemp called that contains hydrastis, echinacea, myrrh, and, and pokeweed. So myrrh is one of the constituents in this for tonsillitis and inflammatory things of the throat. Um, and I would say that this would be something that I would include in any kind of infection. Also for uh, fungal infections, I usually include it. I don't know how, like I haven't looked at all the research, but it's often in my formulas that I use for any kind of suspected infection in the intestinal tract, combined with other herbs like golden seal, wormwood, uh, and then I kind of mix it up with the third or fourth one. So I always use this for any kind of infection when I can. Um, tastes awful. Tastes like turpentine, uh, but that's too bad. I would not use this during pregnancy. It looks like there's some studies showing it's unsafe for that, okay? Podarco is another herb that I often will combine in herbal formulas for uh, as an antimicrobial. The active ingredients are the naphthoquinones. These naphthoquinones in Podarco are called Lapachol, and then in black walnut, it contains Juglone. Both of these herbs are cousins that are, the plant of chemicals are, are very, very closely related. And so you could use one or the other. I, I've used both. Uh, Podarco is from South America. Black walnuts is, grows, there's a plant, I can see it right in front of my office here, grows around where I live, there's an abundance of it. So if you want to make your own herbs and get the benefits, you may as well go with black walnut. I don't think there's, I can't tell you which one's better than the other. Um, they both have antimicrobial effects. I think these naphthoquinones disrupt the mitochondrial uh, electron transport chain, and that's how they exert their action. And they have antimicrobial, antiparasitic. They may have anti-cancer effects. They have a slight astringent effect. Uh, and I think they may have some laxative effects as well. Uh, oops, skipped ahead. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go over because if you got to leave the classroom, just watch it after. Uh, when it comes to laxatives, the next slides are all the same almost. Senna is your classic herb used for as a stimulating laxative when someone has acute constipation and they haven't had a bowel but for a few days. I tend to use things like magnesium as my go-to first as an osmotic laxative, but I will use Senna and I'll tell them to pick up Senna cod or or you can get a tea of it as well. It works. My only concern is that you don't give it to people um, long term because it had the dependency. And obviously, you wouldn't want to give it to someone who's got a pre existing condition like inflammatory bowel disease. If you've got diarrhea, don't take a stimulating laxative to take on. I think these compounds may have some antimicrobial effects as well because in rhubarb root used in Chinese medicine is used to clear heat, so it may have some. Uh, anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial effects. Different forms of buckthorn, there's alder buckthorn, common buckthorn, cascara buckthorn, different species. They're all the same and they're almost the same as, um, as senna. You can use these and I would say that these plants grow in around here more than senna does. Senna things seems to grow more in the Mediterranean area and, and more warmer places, while buckthorn grows around here. I've never used buckthorn. Uh, that's not true. I have used it, but I'd be more inclined to use senna because of the convenience. It's easier. 
This can also cause a little bit more griping, a little bit more cramping with it. But, you know, it's like a post-apocalypse, post uh, you don't have access to anything and you're living in the forest, this is what you use. But practically, I don't use it. The me mechanism of action is it contains anthraquinone glycosides. Aloe resin, another thing, not the gel, but the inner leaf resin contains the anthraquinone glycosides and it's going to be used as a stimulating laxative as well. So whether you use any of the buckthorns, the gel from aloe vera, or senna, they're all the same drug as far as I'm concerned. Uh, some of them are maybe a little bit stronger than other ones, but they're all basically working by the same mechanism. What happens is these anthracrinol glycosides, they travel through your stomach, through your small intestine for the most part, and they end up in your large intestine. And then what happens there is the gut bacteria eat the sugar off, liber liberating the anthraquinone compounds, which then basically works on the influx pumps in the intestine that pump more salt in, waterfalls, salt. You get more hydration, more water in the lumen of the bowel that expands the lumen, and then that stimulates peristalsis that way. And the second thing is I think these anthraquinones also irritate the uh, large intestine to promote bowel movements. Why I'm telling you that is that when you take a senna, it tends to promote a bowel movement within six to eight hours. Might be a little longer, but usually about that. So what most people do is they'll take senna before they go to bed, and then when they wake up in the morning, they have their bowel movement. So uh, because of the time period, they're safe short term. The only issues is it can cause some discoloration of the urine, making it red or brown. So if someone's taking it and they see their urine's a bit red, uh, don't get freaked out. You don't have kidney cancer or bladder cancer. It can also uh, affect your potassium levels. And this is not a big deal for most people, but if you're on like certain heart medication or blood pressure medication, you need to be aware of that because that could be problematic. Uh, it also can stain the color of the lumen of the bowel, which, you know, if you're really self-conscious, you know, how many people are looking at the lumen of your bowel? Uh, not too many people, but if you go and get uh, a colonoscopy done, they'll be able to detect that you've been abusing these or using these by seeing the staining going on there. Uh, and finally, one of the issues with stimulating laxatives, they do cause cramping pain, so it can be uh, combined with fennel or other carminatives to reduce that. Uh, okay. And then last slide is castor oil. So castor oil is also a stimulating laxative. It has great anti-inflammatory effects, but it also acts as a pro-inflammatory as well. So taking castor oil uh, internally long-term can actually cause leaky gut syndrome if you're doing a lot of it. So there's been research showing that. So short-term, it can act as a stimulating laxative, but if you take it more than that, it can actually make the gut leakier and cause gut bacteria to potentially enter into the bloodstream and cause bad things to happen. So uh, at least that's what it does in mice. I don't think there's anything wrong with using castor oil occasionally. It's very, dis it's pretty disgusting stuff to take because it's a very thick, waxy substance. The main active ingredient is ricin oleic acid, which is basically like oleic acid in olive oil, but there's one little OH group stuck on the side. And that's what makes the difference between it being a nutritive thing in olive oil versus a cathartic or stimulating laxative in castor oil. Now, the main difference between castor oil and the anthracrinol glycosides is when you take it internally, castor oil, it's not activated by the gut bacteria. So with the anthracrinol glycosides, they kind of travel through the gut and then they become activated primarily in the large intestine. And that's why it takes six to eight hours to kick in. With castor oil, it can start exerting its effects as soon as it gets into the small intestine. So it's very fast. And so it will increase peristalsis in both the small and the large intestine to purge things out. So it's faster acting. It'll kick in after a few hours, like three to four hours. Uh, did I write that down? Yeah, three to five hours. Okay. Um, and um, it purges the contents of both the small and the large intestine. So that might be better if someone had like an acute poisoning. Um, but... I can see also being more issues with malabsorption. And as I mentioned before, long-term use can lead to that leaky gut. Uh, 
Another thing that's interesting is the way that it works, it binds to a prostaglandin receptor called EP3 receptor in the intestines. And so this is an inflammatory receptor that stimulates peristalsis. But what's neat is that EP3 receptors are also in the uterus. And when you take it, um, it could potentially uh, stimulate uterine contraction to induce labor. And I know my wife took castor oil because she was two weeks late with her with her first child, and she took castor oil uh, by the direction of the midwife to induce labor. And I think it's only going to work if the cervix is ready to induce labor. Uh, and she was able to have a vaginal delivery, and everything was uh, fine, more or less, except for uh, a little bit of meconium in the uh, in her water. But anyways, um, so you could use it, but it's not going to... If your cervix isn't ready for a baby to pass through, taking castor oil is not going to help the situation, okay? So the take home is castor oil is faster acting than the anthraquinone glycosides. It purges the small and the large intestine versus only the large intestine. Um, both of them have risks with taking them long term. So for long term use, you want to go more with an osmotic laxative and a bulk laxative. Okay, so sorry, I went over a little bit. I just want to make sure I finish those slides. Uh, thank you for your patience and your understanding. Uh, so next week's going to be fun. We're going to discuss cases. So how to take everything we learned so far uh, and apply it to uh, to making cases up. And 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 I'll give you real live things that I've done with patients, so you can see what happens. Um, one of my lectures is recording. What I might do is find it and post it now, and we can make that one the very last lex lecture. So if you want to watch it before, because you're thinking maybe I can cover the information in advance and, and when I have some spare time now before cramming everything at the end, uh, would you guys prefer that if I post it now and you guys can watch it whenever you want? And then the last day, um, if we want, we can just leave it. We can all meet on the last day, and then we can discuss any questions you guys have. But that might be a good way to do it. Yeah? So a couple of people say, I mean, you don't want to post it anyway, because if you say no, well, you don't have to watch it until last week. So then last week, what we'll do is we'll post that one, and I will will still meet, but um, it'll be more for review, or if, I, if, I, if I'm not able to cover everything, then we can use it as a little bit of a, of a uh, overview or um, um, backup plan just to cover any last for many things and then we can just spend as much time as you guys want going through sample questions and review for the for the final okay so you guys have a wonderful week uh, i'll get this posted well you guys don't care if you're watching it but uh, i'll get this posted as soon as i can and i'll post the other one uh, today if i can as well okay have a great week and we'll see you guys next time bye for now